So we all know Larry is the stock option sultan, right? <coughs> I am not a sultan, and I would never wear that silly ass hat anyway. <laughs> okay? I'm here just to, three years ago when we opened up this school, it's almost been exactly three years, I knew nothing about stock options, okay? And I just w learned for three years. And over the years, I've developed a few things that I prefer to do that are somewhat different than what Larry does. I I'm still in the rules of Larry's crazy option trader rules, <coughs> but I wanted to share with you today and also show you because Larry's getting a little sick and tired of him being the stock option guy all the time and I'm the real estate guy all the time. And some of you might think that he doesn't know anything about real estate and I don't know anything about stock options and that is not the case. So from now on, Larry and I are on a mission to prove to you that we can juggle multiple things. All right? And it's going to give you some different perspective about like other ways that you may or may not think. So before I get started, I want to know, do we have any professional stockbrokers in the room? We do? Okay, because I'm going to insult the hell out of you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not really, but yeah, really. Okay. I'm not an attorney or an accountant. I'm giving advice based on my experiences and successes. Please feel free to check with your accountant, your attorney, about any techniques that I discuss with you today or for the rest of your life. So now I don't have to say this anymore. All right, let's get started. So if you're a stock option trader or a stock trader, the very first thing that I do, and anyone who's really hooked at being a stock option trader, the very first thing I do in the morning is I'm turning on Fox Business, 6 a.m. in the morning, and I'm opening up my computer. We happen to use CNBC's website because we like the way the charts look. That's the only reason. So they, they have some beautiful charts that are real easy on the eyes to look at. And you can create a watch list for yourself of the stocks that you're interested in. And they've got this little button on the right-hand side for extended hours. Essentially what that does at 6 o'clock in the morning, so the market hasn't opened yet, right? But starting at 6 a.m., you, you flick that little switch for extended hours, but now you can see what the futures are going to be. So at 6.05 in the morning, if you're up and you're having a cup of coffee, you're already starting to think about what's going to happen today in the market and what are you going to do about it. Now, so one of the things I'm going to share with you today is the way that I think about stock options during the day. And I have certain behaviors based off of the different segments that occur as we're going through the day. The market reacts a certain way in the morning, a different way at a different time, and then at certain points it's raging like a bull, and other points it's, it's very, very slow. So that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. But this is the very first thing that I do when I wake up is I'm checking the futures. All right? And I'm usually, you know, I got a touch screen, I'm expanding my screen, I just want to see the stocks that I'm invested in at this moment. I'm not particularly too worried about all of the stocks on this list. I'm mostly focusing on the ones that I've got my money in right now. Like, what are they going to do today? And what am I going to do about that, provided if it's going up or going down or whatever? All right? If you are a stock option trader for real, this is a behavior that you should add to your daily uh, Monday to Fridays, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there, there's another page. So the first one that I just showed you is called the dashboard. That's the one that's over here, the dashboard. But on CNBC, they also have a page called the list. That's the one in the middle. Now, I happen to really like this. So suppose you are sitting with some money in your account. You got a bunch of money in your account and you're trying to figure out where do I want to put this money? What would be a good stock to put my money into? Well, one of the things that's really cool about this, this middle chart called list is 
they're giving you the 52-week low, the 52-week high, and where the stock is right now. So you can, at a moment's glance, see where the bargains are. Instead of going through 15, 25 of the stocks that you're following, looking at the chart for each and every one, that could take quite a while. This is like a quick snapshot to just look at it. And what stands out to you right now? How about this one? Okay? Nikola is at a bargain price right now. And if I could convince all you people to invest in Nikola on Monday, my account's going to go up like rocket ship. Okay? <laughs> so while I'm helping you, I'm also thinking of me. Okay, you know, anyone who knows me, you'll get used to that. Okay? <coughs> I always got some kind of other motive going on. This is a really cool uh, chart to look at, the list. I like the list a lot. Who didn't turn off her cell phone? Who is that? Is that Colin? Colin, that phone better be off, man. Ah, it's probably the guy who voted for Biden. <laughs> All right. So obviously at 9 o'clock when the market actually opens, this extended hours button vanishes. So don't be calling the school saying, Phil's presentation was wrong. There's no extended hours button. We've had people call about that. Okay? So this is a really cool page to use. So if you're not using it, I recommend that you do. Especially if you got a little bit of money and you're thinking about playing it somewhere. This chart can, you know, obviously if I saw Nikola was at such a bargain, that's just like a snapshot look at it. Now I'm going to go into Nikola's chart instead of 25 other charts. I'm going to go into Nikola's chart and I'm going to look at the three month, the six month, just the way we analyze stocks, okay? And you've seen that happen plenty of times if you're a student here. And uh, that's, you've seen the Sultan do it, right? So that's all you have to do. And it helps you to get to where you want to, what you want to think about investing in very quickly. And this is something that I might know at 6.15 in the morning. So that's what stock option guys do. All right. Okay. So let's just say we're going to talk about a typical day in the stock market. And on this particular day, we're going to be having an up day. Okay? The market is going to be going up on this particular day. Right? So the first thing that generally happens is I already know about the futures because I'm up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And if you see that, for example, Facebook is up three points and you're thinking that you can kind of jump in at 9.30 and ride some of that three points up, you are mistaken because you cannot do that. That, that change, that three-point rise, in the stock price or the stock option price will happen instantaneously as the market opens. So you're not going to be able to ride that up, all right? But we know, let's talk a little bit about the people who, who are in the stock market. Um, my personal opinion is that a lot of people who have addictive behaviors, Okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> People who love their money take chances with it. People who probably indulge in some other categories, like alcohol, maybe, maybe something worse, like drugs, maybe sex, all these wonderful addictions that us humans love, okay? And it's funny, if you, if you come to the school and you and you, we're talking about this two nights a week. We're talking about it, we're thinking about it all the time, you're thinking about it when you're not here, you're gonna become an addict, okay? Now you might not become an addict of some of those really bad categories, but the good ones like making money in the stock market, trust me, we're, we're working right now on a small group of people around here. We need to start having like AA, you know, stock <laughs> option meetings together, okay? <laughs> Because some of us are getting hooked big time, like, <laughs> all right? It's definitely happening. 
you know, and, and look, uh, the defense of these individuals is they probably can't help themselves, you know. I sure as hell know there's no way I'm stopping stock options ever. Once you learn how to do this, forget it. I see myself in a rocking chair when I'm 90 <laughs> years old, <laughs> right, with a freaking laptop on my lap trading Facebook. I just, I just know it. It's, you know, I'm either going to be dead or I'm trading stock options because I'm never going to stop. I don't even like the weekends anymore. I used to look forward to them, all right? It used to be like talking to the wife, what are we going to do on Saturday and Sunday? Now I'm like, I freaking hate the weekend. When the hell is the market going to open, all right? You know? Monday morning comes around, it's like Christmas to me, okay? So these, this is the kind of stuff that's going to happen to you, all right? If you hang around us too long, uh, trust me, it's going to happen. All right, so clearly I'm saying, I'm one of them, okay? And there's a, a Bill over there, I'm pretty sure he's with me. He's as screwed up as I am now, you know? I say, how you doing today? He goes, I'm doing terrible, it's Saturday, <laughs> you know? All right, so let's keep going on our up day. But before we switch, I just wanna say something. So from 9.30 to 10.30, okay, on an up day, the market opens up with a fury, all right? Oftentimes, like, the futures get it going, and then it'll run up a little bit. And typically speaking, I avoid putting my money in on the first hour, okay? I want things to kind of cool off a little bit, right? And the next slide <coughs> is going to show you what happens after the market opens with a fury. We call it the coffee break. Now, are all the traders on Wall Street going to get coffee at the same time? Hell yeah, they're all addicts, right? <laughs> Every one of them is an addict. They need to go get a jolt because the first hour they were, they were probably making all kinds of trades, right? So we have noticed that at 10.30, no matter what happens in the first hour on an up day, I'm talking about an up day, we've noticed that the market will, will run like hell for the first hour and at 10.30, you're going to see a pullback, okay? A little pullback. It's not going to be the whole, if Facebook ran up three points in the first hour, it's not going to pull three points back. But it will, you'll see a pullback, an adjustment, and we call that the coffee break. Now, why do we call it the coffee break? Because we're making up excuses why these things would happen. They, they knew the action was hot in the morning, so all the players are out there making their trades, and then at 10.30, they go to get a cup of coffee, okay? And that's why no one's at their desk, no one's at their computer anymore. They're all drinking coffee, all right? At least that's the way we like to imagine it, okay? But the point is to give you a reason to understand that you're going to see pullbacks at a certain time during the day, and at other times it's going to do the opposite, all right? So by calling it a coffee break, you know what we're talking about at 10.30. Start looking for it, and you're going to start to notice it. So if you have intention of buying Facebook on a day when it's going up three points, you're going to wait until 10.30. And you're going to look for the bargain that you're going to find at 10.30. And I can't assure you there's going to be a bargain there, but I can tell you this. Out of all of the different names that I'm going to give to the stock option day today, this one is clearly the most obvious one. You will see it almost every day. Not every day, but almost every day. The reason I've chosen an up day is because, has anyone here tried to invest in a put? Okay? Okay. It's a little difficult to wrap your head around a put. It shouldn't be that difficult, right? You're betting on it to go down. It should be easy. It's not. I can't explain it. On an up day, I have a real good feel for what's going to happen. Show me a down day. Man. It's like a put for me. I don't know what the hell's going on and my predictions become less accurate on a down day. But on an up day, I feel pretty good about it, okay? So this 10.30 period is a great time if you're looking to buy something, even if it's up in the morning. Wait till the 10.30 coffee break. Keep your eyes on the screen during that time, all right? Maybe 10.30 to 11.30. Sometimes it'll start running at 11. But if you start paying attention to it, you'll begin to see the patterns. And that's all I'm really trying to do here today is show you that there are some patterns, at least in my perspective. I see patterns that are very repetitive. And it's not always, it's not 100%, but 
but it is something that you can count on and look for, especially when you're getting ready to invest some of your money. Okay? So, let's keep going. So what happens next? Now my imagination is really running, okay? Sometime around like noon to 1.30, the market seems to me to sort of just lollygag around for a while. It doesn't really have a direction. It goes up, it goes down, it goes sideways. It goes left, it goes right. It never seems to have a distinctive thing that it does, okay? So in my mind, I came up with something. I said, they're all out at lunch. They all went around the block to Capitol Grill. And while they were there, like, what the hell, we're paying $250 for lunch. We might as well order a couple of cocktails, right? So, so they have a few cocktails and uh, maybe more than a few. Noon to 1.30. It's the period that I typically, I might want to get in or I might not want to get in, depending on what I'm trying to buy and if I think that is... Uh, an opportunity arises that I see on my charts, then I might be interested in jumping in during that time frame, okay? So from noon to 1.30 is a possible time that you can use to buy, all right? Especially if at the coffee break the, the stock pulled back and it's still sitting in the same area, you know, it just gives you more time to think about it and analyze it and figure out what you want to do. It's not necessarily a bad place to make a buy. All right, let's keep going. So what do these guys do? They go to Capital Grill, they spend all this money, they have a, a couple too many cocktails. What do they do? They got to take a nap now, right? Between the food that they're getting fed there and the cocktails, they need to nap. So I call the 1.30 to 2.30, that's the nap time, right? And by the way, if you look up like uh, the uh, value of people who nap, they tend to be pretty smart, effective people. It's just like charging your cell phone, right? Charge it in for a while, take a little break off the damn thing, and you'll come back later, and now you're ready to rock and roll. So after lunch, I view it like they're getting tired, they're slightly toasted, it's nap time. The good news is the market's still up, because in this imaginary stock option day, the market's up all day, okay? So at 1.30, 2.30, there's going to be not a lot happening. Another segment, an extension of the lunch. Almost uh, not a whole heck of a lot is happening. Moves are not happening. But the moves are going to happen soon, okay? So I know a, a stock trader. His name is Kenny Glick. And he's a crazy He's insane, is what he is. He's, he's not just crazy, he's insane. He's, he's got some serious issues, this guy. But he's an awesome uh, stock trader and that I found uh, through uh, a company that was sending me some leads. And one of the things that he always says is, don't tell me what you're doing in the market today. Talk to me at 3.20. Talk to me at 3.20 is kind of what he says a lot. And his point is, is that the action... If you're going to sell anything, you want to be selling it between 3.20 and 4 p.m. Because often what happens is something, <coughs> at least my perception of what happens, is the following. So the market opens up almost like gangbusters, and it starts running. And your particular stock might hit high point of the morning before the coffee break. Okay? You should be looking for that in the stocks that you're invested in. And in my opinion, it doesn't happen 100% of the time. It doesn't happen all the time. But the stock will then pull back at the coffee break, lollygag for half of the day, and it will go back to that high at the end of the day, in between 3.20 and 4 o'clock. Okay? Now, these are just predictions of what I see, but in my mind, it's very clear to me that this is a repetitive thing that happens. I can't explain why it happens, so I make up names like nap time and lunch time and c coffee break. But guess what? It's really easy to remember, right? 
Just remember, at 1030, you, you inv this, these stock traders, they're investing for an hour. They're going hot and heavy. Now they've got to take a break, so they go get some coffee. And then they might as well just go into lunchtime because they know the action's not coming back until the end of the day. So they go to lunch, they have a few cocktails, they take a nap. All of a sudden, it's getting close to 3.20. Now it's time to get serious again because all of the action is happening in the morning and at the end of the day, 3.20 to 4 o'clock. That's my perception. I didn't read this anywhere. Some of it came out of Larry's mouth. The rest of it I, I kind of invented as I'm watching this repetitive behavior. And many, many times I know I, I, I don't want to jump in early morning. For some reason, I just, I just don't like throwing my money in early morning, okay? And, and maybe that's because a number of times I've bought stuff, I thought I had a great buy, and then I watched it go down the rest of the day, and I hate that feeling, right? But um, I would try to, I'm doing most of my buying at the coffee break. When I know I'm getting a discount, and I'm doing almost all of my selling between 3.20 and 4 o'clock. And the later you wait into that gap, the better you deal you usually get. Not all the time. Sometimes it's running like it's going to go crazy right to 4 o'clock. And I'm thinking I'm going to sell it at 5 minutes to 4. And then it trims back on you. So, look, there's, this is not an exact science, right? But for those of you who are trading stock options all the time, you probably have noticed some of these trends. I wanted to give, you, give it a name, okay? I wanted to give it a name that you could remember uh, about this funny time. Okay. So 3.20, between the hours of 3.20 and 4 o'clock, and like I said, often the highs of the morning will repeat themselves in this final push, okay? So, let's talk about some other things that I do slightly different. All right, so this is an option chain. And it is for Apple, okay? So let's just say I'm looking at the May 21st calls. That's this section that's opened up. And I've only got six choices. Six choices of what I want to do with Apple. And I just took this snapshot last night, so... What's Apple trading right now? Like 120, something like that, right? Hmm? Yeah, okay. Let's, we'll call it 120, right? So the strike price over here. I don't know. I missed that joke. What did I miss? Because I blew Will's idea off? Okay. All right. So. Everything in the shade, we call it in the money. Everything in the white, we call it out of the money. Or, some people will call this money. This is really in the money, and this is really at the money, okay? So if you hear those phrases, you know what we're talking about. So, this is the price you're paying for the option, right? This is the strike price that you're going to get. For those of you who are new here and don't know about this stuff, just, just... Just absorb what you can, all right? A lot of people try to go cheap when they're, when they're buying their option. Like, they don't want to pay $16. They want to pay $7. And so if you bought 120 strike price and it's costing you $7, then your break-even point, before you can start making money, Apple's got to go to 127 You got that? It's a pretty simple formula. I'm going to show you the formula in a minute. When I first started trading options in the first couple of years, I always would buy like the last in the money option or the first out of the money option was typically where I operated because I didn't want to spend too much money. One of the threats about spending too much money is the more money you spend on the, on the option price, the, the higher the strike price and the option price put together, which we call the mark, if you put those two things together, you have to get above that number before you can start making money. I don't like that, okay? So I've changed, about a year ago, I changed my philosophy. I don't want to, I don't care what I pay for the option almost anymore. Now, I find my eyes, my thought pattern, my behaviors 
are constantly buying the top line, okay? So I'm basically paying a lot more money. I'm paying, so for example, I might pay $16 to get this stock option, but just do the math. So 105 plus $16, right? That's where the stock price is right now, almost. Give or take a buck, right? So Apple only needs to go up, if I bought that option, Apple only needs to go up a buck, a buck and a half, and guess what happens to my screen? It's green. One time, Bill said, somebody, no, Scott said that. Somebody asked Scott, they said, when do you sell your options? And he goes, when they turn green. I thought to myself, that's freaking brilliant. <laughs> Why did I ever think of that? <laughs> yeah, it's green, okay? But th then I started thinking about it some more, and I thought, you know what? Let's just suppose that I had $50,000 in Apple, right? And Apple wasn't doing much. It's not doing much right now. So it's kind of just sitting there, and it's annoying, and I'm waiting for the damn thing to move, right? Let's just suppose that Mark Zuckerberg got caught picking up a hooker on Hollywood, Hollywood Boulevard, okay? And Facebook stock is about to drop uh, 80 points, or it's dropping 80 points right now. If your stocks were green, and they didn't have a $10,000 loss, you know what you could do? You could dump your Apple real quick, and you could convert that money right into Facebook and benefit off of that huge drop. So I like buying things deep into the money now. It's almost always what I choose. And uh, I'm sure some people who have more experience than I would have an opinion on why I do that or why I shouldn't do that, and I'd love to hear that. But for me, I love the fact that my options are turning green very quickly. And if that costs me some money, so what? Have you ever had a big loss in stock options? If you haven't, it hurts pretty bad, right? I'd rather pay that sucker down and live with the consequences than, than watching something tank, all right? So it's a, to me, it's a much safer play. And I find myself doing it very repetitive all the time. Okay. So when you're looking at an option chain, I'm giving you something to think about here, all right? You could think about it yourself, and all you really have to do is add up the strike price and the option price. So let's get into some of the formulas that I use, okay? The mark is what you're paying for the option at the time you buy it, and that's, that's the price of the option that you're buying, not the strike price. So the mark is M. S is the strike price. So, for example, we talk about intrinsic value here. Intrinsic value is like equity in your house, okay? So, if the mark, all right, minus the strike price, that equals I. That's how you figure out what the intrinsic value is. So, if you're buying down the stock like I'm doing, I'm buying the strike price down, I'm buying intrinsic value, okay? And if you want to know how much intrinsic value you're buying, there's your formula. It's super easy. For any of you stock traders, you should take a picture of this screen. I'm going to leave it up for a few minutes. So the, these formulas are super simple, all right? So the mark minus the strike price equals your intrinsic value, all right? <coughs> Let's go to the next one. Suppose you want to know what you're paying for your time value, okay? The time value minus the intrinsic value, I'm sorry, the price of the option minus the intrinsic value equals the time value. Super simple stuff. But you should know this stuff. You should be able to calculate it. If you're, in a, if you're trading your money, you want to make sure that you know what the heck you're doing. All right? Now, so I was talking about breaking even, right? When I buy down the strike price, cost me more money, but usually when you're on that option chart and you're at the top of that option chart, it's costing you more money, but it's also a safer play in my opinion, okay? If you want to know what your break even is, all you do is add up the strike price plus the mark equals B. B is your break even point. So you need Apple to go past your break-even point in order for your stock to turn green. That's what you need, okay? This is not complex math here. This is easy stuff, 
All right, I'm just giving a name to it. All right, so all these things that you see in red, these are for buying options, okay? The stuff that you see in blue is something that I have put together because I'm kind of beginning to do covered calls. I got a brother who has a stock account. He's not doing so well with it. I said, why don't you let me take over your account? He said, fine, I'll let you take over my account as long as you promise me you're never going to lose money. <laughs> Guess what? I said, I can do that, right? I'm going to do all covered calls for him, right? When he's not paying attention, I'll probably make some good moves for him and not tell him about it. But um, if I lose money, I'll, I'll say I'm sorry, right? <laughs> Okay? If I was trading your account and I lost some money, you forgive me, wouldn't you, Andrew? <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> I'd ask for advice later. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, some of the people in this school who've helped me out with these formulas, who are doing covered calls on a regular basis, all right, I came up with this little formula. So, OP, that's the option price, all right? SP is the stock price, the actual stock price. So, if I so the option price, say you're in this formula, the option price was $2.99, right? And the stock price, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the strike price, I'm talking about the stock price. The stock price at the moment was $88.82, okay? So to calculate your rate of return or what kind of money you're going to make off of a covered call, you simply take the option price, which is $2.99, and you divide it by the strike by the stock's price at the very moment you're doing this. It's $88.82. You should make a rate of return of 3.3% off of that trade. And keep in mind that this is based on a weekly trade, just a five-day trade. Anybody here like to make 3.3% on their money a week? Okay. I frankly don't even know how to calculate what that would be a year, but if there's a math genius in the room, I'd like to borrow you for five minutes. We could talk outside if you want, right? I'd, I'd like to know what that would work out to be. It's not that easy, because it's snowballing, yeah. So it's like a snowball run, rolling down Mount Everest. You're, you're making X amount of dollars the first week, but the next week you got more money to trade with, so guess what? It gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and it gets get bigger, and I don't know how to calculate that, right? If I did, I would have put it on this chart for you guys to look at, all right? All right, let's do, anybody got any questions about this before I flick off the screen? Pedro. If you had to choose between options and calls or puts, which one would you choose, the calls or the puts? I hate puts. I can't wrap my head around it. All right. Is uh, that what you're asking me, if I like calls or puts better? How many times have you done puts? I'm a very optimistic, positive guy. <laughs> puts go down. Calls go up. I like the calls. I actually avoid puts. I've, I, I believe in negative karma associated with puts causes me to lose money. And I did absolutely nothing wrong. <laughs> yes, Dan. Okay, on the covered calls, um, to, so you're buying the option, let's say the 299, are you buying for every option one share of stock? Now, covered that? calls are different. You have to buy 100 shares of the stock. Okay. So there, uh, TD Ameritrade, for example, has a tool. The page is called the buy, buy, sell page. And you have to set it up. There's options of different trades that you could do, and you have to set it up for a covered call. And then what you do is you buy 100 shares of, say, Apple. Okay? You have to buy, actually physically buy the 100 shares, paying whatever the strike price is at the time you buy it, or whatever the stock price is at the time you buy it. You have to buy the 100 shares. Then you sell an option simultaneously 
at the same time. You put in the order, buy 100 shares of Apple. And then you also put in an order that says sell uh, one contract of Apple in a covered call, right? And when you hit enter, it does both transactions simultaneously. So you're basically buying the stock and selling the put. And no, you're buying the stock and you're selling an option. You could sell a put or a call. You could sell either. Oh, you could. You could. You could sell so either. So you would do this, you would sell a call. I would do this for my brother, right, right, but not I'm for me. No, 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 for your brother. If somebody right. was looking to just make 3% a week. 3% a week, yeah. Right, if they're looking to make 3% a week, you would. And next you week, would, you'll make 3.3 3 right, the first it's, week. It's yeah. great, yeah. it's great. Yeah. If, but if you're buying 100 shares of stock, you're selling one call as well? Right, you, you, you could buy you could buy 1,000 shares of the stock and sell 10 calls. Right. right. It depends on how much money you have. Right. And you can do this all day long. Right? There are people here that are doing it now. No, no, I know. I'm yeah. just wondering if you're selling a call or selling a put. Or you can whatever. do either. Uh, you, you don't want to do the put. You want to do just the call. All right. It's for if you have a short stock, you could sell a right. covered put. Forget it. <laughs> you think puts are complicated? Yeah, I don't want to touch it. I don't so, want to touch the... Yeah, stay, stay away from, stay away from short sales of covered puts. I don't... Pedro, I'm positive, man. What are you bringing up this topic for? Huh? Take away his tickets. <laughs> okay. So, let's recap what I think these guys do in a day. Okay? They're a bunch of addicts that are trading from 9.30 to 10.30. Then they're drinking coffee. Then they're uh, having lunch. Then they're sleeping. Okay? Then they're finally trading again at 3.20 to 4. Just watch the trends and tell me if you see it. And give me some feedback on it. If you don't see it, or if you do see it, I'd love to hear that, because I see it. I kind of feel it, because, look, I usually, I used to go to the gym all the time, around 3 o'clock, 3.30, I like to play basketball. A lot of basketball players show up at LA Fitness around that time, so I like to go to the gym. I can't even freaking go to the gym that time anymore now, because I got to stay home and become one of these addicts at 3.20 to 4. I got to be sitting in front of my computer, okay? These are the problems I worry about, Pedro. Okay. <laughs> All right. Phil. Janet. Wait, Phil. We need a mic for her, and Kirk has a question. Okay. Lay it on me, Kirk. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, Don't get on negative on me. I, no, I'm not getting negative on you. So, so based upon these basic behaviors and how long have you been doing them, um, you've re three years. Yeah. All right. So you believe that's reduced um, your risk. Somewhat, yeah. Okay. Having a feel for when, okay, one, here's a typical thing that the traders make a mistake when they first get started, and I know it because I did it. I saw, for example, a stock I wanted to buy running up in the morning, so what did I try to do? I tried to jump in it. As soon as I jump in there, it starts trimming back, okay? Or just bizarre things happen. So you, you learn from your mistakes. You lose money, that hurts. You don't want to make a habit of that, so you try to learn from your mistakes and you try to make, what, what the rules are predicated on not losing money. They're not predicated on making you money. They're really protective rules to make sure you don't screw up. And this is just something that I, Larry started it with the coffee break and I kind of expanded it because I saw different trends repeating themselves time and time again. And now I just gave it all a name, and I believe it, and I think like this during the day. We, they're, they're handling the mics. You've got to get one of them. Hi, Janet. Hi. Uh, just quick again, what are, you, what are you calling the mark? Is that the actual price the of the stock? The mark is the price of the option. Oh, the price of the option. Okay, right. thank you. Okay. I will do Michael McAndrews. Hey, Phil. Hey. When you're looking at the bid ask, is there a sweet spot? you put in when you're buying that call option or, or where, where do you go with the bid ask yeah the it's well you're supposed to just you're supposed to just split the two of them together uh, sometimes I try to go on the low side then it just sits there and it doesn't get uh, worked and so I t what I typically do is I just I just look at it real quick and I throw in a number that's approximately in the middle and then I go right to the page where it's about to get filled and I expand that page and I look at what the last one was and what the, and because the bid ask is changing all the time. So really the best way to do it I think is that way. That's how I'm doing it now. So I just look at the number, I quickly pick the middle 
and even if the middle's a little low or a little high, I don't care. And then I go right to the page and I expand it to the two line and I watch it and I'll just adjust it so you can just change it. So if you're a quarter too low, you just raise it a quarter, you change the, the, the price that you want to buy it for, and then you got to go down to the bottom and hit submit. So you have to hit submit. A lot of people forget to do that step and then it never happens. So that's what I do. Hi. Well. <laughs> what are you doing so close to me for, huh? All right. All right. So, so on an up day, like, for Facebook, uh, for example, it broke out. There's no new pattern. That's f like that's like that for all your stocks. Green. Do you um, go and put your money into a covered call, or do you even think about doing puts, or do you just let your money sit until you find another opportunity? The only reason I'm doing covered calls is because my brother told me I'm not allowed to lose any of his money. Okay. No, but okay. if it's yeah. your account anyway, yeah. would you just wait on in, it? In or? my account, I, I, I'm only doing them because I'm trying to learn them okay. so I can help him. Uh, I don't really think it's for me, but uh, I had a meeting with some guy in the school here, John Baum, and John and I were talking about how much money we think we could really make. If you had a couple hundred thousand dollars to invest and you were doing nothing but covered calls, it actually gets really interesting of what you could do with it. So it's definitely something I want to learn more about. I'm going to do it because I need to learn it, because I promised my brother I would do it for him. So I'm going to learn it. But if you had a couple hundred grand that you could get into, buy the stock, sell the cover calls, pick up 3% every week, and you were trading hundreds and thousands of dollars, it gets very interesting. Bill, I'm uh, currently making about 3000 a week on $100,000 doing covered calls only. 3000 so a week on 100000 so covered. So you're investing 100000 mm -hmm. and you're getting 3000 bucks a week. Well, there you go. Pretty much. All right, so do the math. So, and oh, keep in oh. mind that it keeps snowballing because you, you almost can't lose. we got to stop paying him. He makes yeah. more money in the stock options than he makes we more should. salary. He's, he's making more with the stock options than right. his salary. I'm we, just we here for fun now. <laughs> and, then, and, and then he grabs me and he says, and he goes, hey, and, and then he says, like, Larry, you, what do you think of this stock? Well, what kind of job does he have? We're paying him. He should be but paying us. So they give you a mic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll go to right, When you're now... To give an example, uh, I heard the show last His mic's going out. Yeah. Can we get it? Hello? Mic? There. Yeah. And uh, Nicola at June Option. Nicola at June, June Option, June 18th Option. Okay. Right? On a call option, obviously. So <coughs> what charts do you guys use to term and determine how far out you want to buy your options yes. for? How far you out? How, what chart do you use to find out how? We far always buy out? out past earnings. Okay. The charts that we look at are the three month, the six month. You just analyze the charts. And then go from there. It's three months, six months for what you, that time period is going to be. If you attend, if you attend the class here, the stock options Sultan, the guy with the funny hat, <laughs> he'll be here every night at 8:45, uh, and he, you will watch him actually do that. So I, I, I've been here for okay, okay. For one, I'm that's what we all. That's what we all do. Coming here. <laughs> that's what every. Uh, I don't think anybody here is doing anything different. That's how we analyze it. But basically, three months, six months. Yep. We got any last minute questions? I got one more question I can take. It might. Oh, sorry. Hi. Not a question. It's an answer. Five hundred forty-one percent. How'd you come up with that? And based on what? Based on. 3.3% raised to the 52nd power 52 weeks per year. Uh, one more time, would you say that? 3.3% <laughs> raised to the 52nd power, since there's 52 weeks in a year. On your money, if you manage 3.3% per week compounding through the whole year, you'd make 541% on your money. 541%. You're welcome. My stock broker used to do that all the time, Phil, and, then, and uh, maybe I shouldn't do stock options. So I, I figure I'll give him... I'll give them two tickets for that one, I think. I like it. <laughs> okay, give him right. another one just because you said that. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I had to talk to you later. I'm out of, I'm out of time. All right. I want to hear back from you people. I want you to start 
thinking about these addicts and their coffee breaks and tell me if you start to see it or maybe I'm crazy. Okay? Thanks for listening today. I had a great time.